Welcome back, everyone, to Beyond the Helmet. And of course, that's hashtag BTH pod if you're following on social media. I'm your host, Steve McGrath, and today I am with a Cleveland Browns legend. It is none other than the former defensive player of the year, former Pro Bowl, all pro defensive tackle, Jerry Shirk. Jerry, how are you today? Doing good, Steve. Uh, really glad to be here today. Really excited to talk with you. I, and I certainly appreciate you taking the time. I, I'm more than excited uh, for a number of reasons, all of which we're going to get into. Uh, but to start, the Cleveland Browns, uh, for the first time in a while now in, in this Baker Mayfield era, um, the Browns have a lot to be excited about after um, a, a couple of years there where it was a little bit of despair, something that maybe at times you had seen as a player. But since you are one of the all-time great Browns, I have to imagine you, you feel pretty good about the state of uh, where Cleveland football is today. I feel pretty good about it. Uh, like a lot of Cleveland fans, I'm a little, uh, little bit downhearted from the injuries they've just experienced. Uh, you know, who knows when Baker will, Baker Mayfield will hit the field again. And I guess what their two top Offensive tackles are out. Their two top running backs are out. Although, uh, what's his name? Is it er Ernesto? Uh, D, D. Ernesto Johnson did a terrific job against uh, Denver a while back. But uh, I guess part of being a uh, uh, Cleveland Browns fan is always being hopeful because that's all we can we can be we always hope it's next year next year although they they did have have a really good year last year but I hope everybody gets healthy and I hope they can be a force yeah and we all need hope and thankfully Cleveland Browns have more of it than, than maybe some of us uh that's a good thing good trait to carry with us uh, <laughs> But just speaking of injuries, if we could just jump a little bit into your career, you, know, you, you did have a knee injury, but, but more specifically for, for any of our younger viewers and listeners out there, in 1980, you had a staph infection that re reportedly uh, came close to almost killing you. Do, do you recall what exactly those circumstances were that, um, that led to that? And if we could zoom out from there, you know, how does that sort of... Uh, frame how you look at life when seemingly a small infection from playing a game uh, nearly ends it all? Uh, yeah, so uh, I was actually in my my 10th year and I was, uh, uh, I'd had some previous injuries and I was leading the league, I think in my 10th game, I was leading the league in sacks. I believe I had 12. Who's counting, right? Me. <laughs> um, and we played Philadelphia and I had a boil on my right arm and I scraped it, didn't think anything about it. And I was sitting in a, a team meeting on Monday and my legs started cramping up. And I thought that's strange. And I got up and walked off the cramp. And then on the way home, I lived uh, about 20 miles out of uh, town. Uh, the pain just became tremendous. And I called the team trainer when I got home. I actually crawled from the from my van to the house to make that phone call. And he lived nearby. We went over to Cleveland Clinic. Uh, they, um, they took a couple of days to, to biopsy what was going on or to, uh, you know, to, to find out what bacteria was in there. And a staph infection had centered in the middle of my left knee, had gone through my system. And uh, you can imagine having a boil start somewhere in the middle of your body uh, very, very painful. So this was in the middle of my left knee and uh, they, um, they put uh, drains in and out of, you know, pumps and drains in and out of it. And uh, I lost about 40 pounds in three weeks. So I went from maybe 255 to what, two, 215 in three weeks. And they thought uh, that the bacteria might still be alive because I had a fever even two and three weeks in they realized that it was a reaction I was having to an antibiotic that they had given given me but yeah for a while uh it was kind of scary I would have I remember this one time in the middle of the night a doctor came came in on his rounds and I looked up woke up and he he looked down at me and he said 
God has put a terrible burden upon you. <laughs> and I'm like, don't tell, don't tell me that. It's almost like he's telling me that I'm, you know, going, going on. So that was kind of the, um, the start of the end for, for me. I came back and I, I played one more year, but I kind of limped through it. Uh, it was actually, you know, beneficial in a way because uh, I was not a first teamer. They put me in on third down pass rush. And it just kind of allowed me to, to see kind of the, the mechanisms, the machinery of the, the NFL and the personalities and uh, just allowed me to come up for a breath of air and take a look around before I exited the game. So when you think about that whole experience, how much does that shape what you do from there? I, I mean, is it really just sort of, uh, okay, that, that gives you sort of the kick out the door to think about life after football, or is there anything about that experience that, you know, you felt it moved you in a way that uh, you wanted to focus your attention someplace else? Well, there were so many things that happened to me on the way out. And I think they happened to a lot of players, you know, one being injury when you're playing in the NFL and the money is good, although it wasn't nearly as good back then, you usually leave because you're too injured to play. So players often leave with a lifelong injury, a bad knee or a bad shoulder, a bad neck, bad back, whatever it be. Um, I was going through a divorce at the time. Um, I had started a new career. I had studied uh, photography and worked in the field for uh, several years. And, and I developed the skills to be a, uh, you know, a decent uh, freelance photographer. Uh, but I, I, uh, I left the game and like a lot of people, it's kind of like leaving or being dumped by a girlfriend or a significant other. You don't want to live in the same city. So I didn't want to be Jerry Shirk, the guy who used to, you know, be a great Cleveland Brown. I had a place in California. Uh, so I, I left and went to California and, and distanced myself from football and but still I had all these things going on and and later on I studied psychology and you learn in psychology and it's common sense that stressors add up so if you look at the things I was going through uh, a knee injury a change of career change of your financial stability change of home change of circle of friends change of you know losing your significant other uh lack of uh, being in a surrounding where every you're told what to do and when to do it and how much to weigh and how fast to be and how strong to be and and you know what to eat and then all at once you're just you're just kind of out there so at first I was excited uh, I did have a career in photography you know, something I was interested in and a really good place to, to live. And I had a circle of friends out in California. But then after a while, I can remember it was about six months out, Steve. Um, I, I had a, this little place that was beautiful. It had a little redwood house. It was an acre. It was about a block from the Pacific in a place called Cardiff by the Sea, California. And uh, I was wearing just a, a pair of shorts on probably October, November day. And I went down to my mailbox and I pulled out the mail. I looked up at the palm trees and the blue sky and the palm fronds were swaying in the wind. And in my mind, it just came to me, it's quiet. And it will always be quiet for me. There will never be that rush of adrenaline of being in Cleveland Stadium and flying through the air, you know, um, on your way to hitting the quarterback and the roar of the crowd and even things that um, I hadn't thought that much about, uh, walking through the tunnel underneath old Cleveland Stadium with 45 of my teammates on the old wooden planks that were put down and when they built the stadium probably in 1931 and it's just it's just a, an experience like uh, you can't have any other place it's a long kind of a dark tunnel that used to come up at the at the Cleveland Indians dugout because we shared the stadium with the Cleveland Indians and and the first guy would pop out you know, and he, he, you could be the last guy in the roar. That crowd would come up that darkened tunnel and the hair on the back of your neck would just stand up. So that's just, you know, 
one of the many things that 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 you miss uh, but it 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 just it took a it took a few months before i realized that hey there's going to be a transition here and even though things are going really good for me there's a whole lot that i miss about playing in the nfl I, you paint such a picture. I, I feel like we could have Ed White paint us uh, a re representation of it. No, but the way that you just described that, if you were to put a word on it, is that that realization that you had, is that more of a, uh, a feeling of despair? Is it calming? Is, you know, how does it, how did it make you feel to have this sort of realization? What, what sort of uh, emotions run through your head realizing that something has to come next? That's a good question. Uh, I think the emotions can be different at different different times. And it wasn't like all at once I was confused or depressed, but uh, you know, on different days you feel different things. At that time, it was just kind of a realization that even though things were, were going really good for me, that there was something else tugging at me and it was uh, my former life and that um and i probably didn't realize this until a little later of, of all the different things that that i missed and and then starting to talk with other retired players um uh but even before getting to you know the on the subject of talking to other players um i think my experience was not unlike a lot of other players in that you think that you're the only one feeling this and and um we can get into this a little bit later but when i did my research it was not unlike uh former combat veterans and i'll as i say that i want to honor combat veterans because they you know they they give give their life and their being for the country and they've seen a lot more horror than a football player is but i've even heard them talk about those similar experience and they uh, sometimes talk about it like an nfl football team you know they're on their their team uh but it's it's kind of like uh you know you're mixing it up you're um you're playing football your body is involved there's a threat of injuries uh and then uh, all at once you're sitting on the couch with the channel changer just going what what was that and, and you know i've talked to, to former uh military veterans and they say the same thing you know i was over in vietnam and uh, i was over there for six months or a year and then i i cycled out alone and here i am sitting on the couch with uh with the channel changer what was that <laughs> what was that all about so again, there's just just a lot of lot of changes, and I think um, what what I want to do, you know, my my kind of message to former ball players is that hey, that's normal, and it's really it's hard for ball players because we've always been the hero. We're always you know the warriors, the one that kind of steps in and well, you know, I'm I'm going to fix it or I'm going to track down the quarterback or I'm going to catch the ball or throw the ball. And uh, you know, kind of, kind of save the day. But when you're out of football, you don't have those avenues, and uh, you, your, your, kind of your sense of your identity of being the hero is no longer there, and it it really does become an identity crisis. But again, uh, you know, my my main message is that you know, to ball players, if they're feeling it. If you're feeling confused and depressed and, you know, uh, an identity crisis, relationship problems, can't find that career that's going to launch you into your next, you know, part of life, well, that's normal. You know, just <laughs> hang in there. I've done enough of these to know that it is normal. Uh, and I, hitting, you hit the nail right on the head when you say identity crisis. Uh, you know, basically, you none of us are anything more than an, an accumulation of stories we tell ourselves as to who we are. And if one of those central chords is, I'm a professional athlete, well, when you no longer are, there's a gaping hole in, in, in what that story is uh, of who you are. So I, I, 
can imagine it's an all too common occurrence for anyone that leaves a high profile position or career to go to something that is has much less fame to it uh, to adjust to that. But but before we move on, I, I wanted to note uh, Merging Vets and Players is an organization that actually helps you know military uh, members from our military that come back from deployment with former, I believe uh, this MVP works with uh, only football players. Maybe there are some other sports athletes, but the, the camaraderie of, you know, being on a football team versus being in a military unit, uh, there are a lot of parallels there that maybe to the outside person that hears it, they, they think it's a bit extreme, but I mean, football is sort of the gladiator sport of today. So it's, it is the closest thing to actual violence uh, that you would see in wartime, even though there's a big jump from, from there to, to being out on a battlefield. Um, I, I think it's well documented that uh, it, it's the closest parallel there is. Yeah. And, and it, I'm glad you mentioned that organization and I'd like to explore them more. They're probably doing great work, but when, when I took a look at it many years ago and, and even talked to people who counsel the, the war vets, there were just so many, similarities, you know, beginning in with you cycle in alone, you cycle out alone. It's about uh, having a close culture, working closely with a, uh, a set of fellows that you could regard as team, the susceptibility of injuries undergoing the same, you know, conditions. Uh, so maybe in the military, it's a lieutenant or a captain that, you know, you're angry with. And in football, it's the, you know, you're always kind of, Kind of fighting the coach or bitching about the coach, uh, in in combat there's in the military there's uh, there's ranks there's uh, there's uh, medals in football there's uh, Pro Bowls, <laughs> and there's uh, you know there's there's a there's awards so it's a lot of similarity and and a lot of it has to do I think with what's going on with the body you know if you're in combat you're just constantly pumping that adrenaline in the same same way in in sports too and there have been a lot of studies about uh combat soldiers who come back and they just have a natural deficiency of uh endorphins and serotonin because it's always been pumping they've, they've always been in fight or flight and now they're sitting on the couch and you just have a natural depression and it takes a while for your body to to um to, to come back to homeostasis. Absolutely. So uh, to talk a little bit more about finding a career and success after being a professional athlete, uh, I, I think I need to ask a little bit about how you find it as a professional athlete. So for you to go on this four-year run of, you know, back to back to back to back Pro Bowls, that's when you get the Defensive Player of the Year Award, the All-Pro nomination, you know, that starts for you in year four. Now, uh, for those that don't know, you know, you are a prolific wrestler in college, both at community college and at Oklahoma State, an All-American, while also developing into a very good football player who only played, you know, one year of high school ball. But throughout the college process, you continued this sort of upward trajectory. When you think about that kid who is a great wrestler and a, a, an improving, but maybe not great football player in college, uh, very good, but not, not elite necessarily. How do you think about how you were able to just continually raise your game basically over an eight year period to get to the point where you're literally considered the best football play, the best defensive football player in the world? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I, I think, you know, you speak about wrestling. I think wrestling had a lot to do it, uh, do with it. When I was at Oklahoma State, you know, Oklahoma State is big time in wrestling. I was heavyweight wrestler there. Um, I saw how the other wrestlers worked out and the price that they paid and, and actually went through those workouts with them. Um, so workouts for Oklahoma State wrestling were a lot easier than the NFL, although the NFL training camps were sometimes brutal and hard and hot and everything, but I, I weighed them against an experience of being in the wrestling rooms at Oklahoma State and, and working even, even harder. So one, one was the, the workouts, the other was the, um, 
the the fact that you're going one on one. So I took that mentality into the game. So when other guys lined up, maybe on the defensive line, they might think I I need to beat these three guys or you know these eleven guys. But for me, walking out the last person on the mat at Oklahoma State, and if you lost, the team lost. That's pressure. So it, so I took that sort of mindset into I got to beat this guy across from me. And I think the third thing was just the balance that you learn in wrestling. I was able to bring into football, the push and the pull and the misdirections and, and so forth. Um, when I got to Cleveland, I had a really good coach named Dick Mojaleski. He became a mentor to me. Uh, he was just a tremendous coach. He had played for the Giants and uh, also for the Browns. And he had played the exact same position, right? Defensive tackle. So he saw something in me. And that's a debt to me. I'm in the mentoring world today. I've been working in youth mentoring for 25 years or so. A good definition of a mentor is somebody that sees something in you that you don't see in yourself. So as I went through my first couple of years, I struggled. Um, it takes to me, it takes about looking back, it took about 30 minutes to, to learn the keys. And the keys in football and the defensive line are what to do when the people in front of you move in certain directions. So it's things like if you're lining up on the guard and he fires out on you, you have to fight force with force. If he takes a side but still is pushing on you, you push that way because that's where the ball is. If he leaves and goes, you know, goes flat down the line, you have to look the other way because there's going to be a trap or there could be a trap, or it could be that he's actually going to lead the sweep. So you can learn those keys in 30 minutes, but, but the trick is that it takes years to actually to do it without thinking and to do it in motion. So uh, it took me two or three years to begin to be able to uh, react to keys without thinking about them. And then finally, when I did, it just opened up a new world. I didn't have to think about what was happening. I did it automatically. And instead of just looking at what was in front of me, I could start to be like a radar and scan the, the you know, what was happening on the sidelines and more on the scoreboard and down, you know, the down in distance and, and looking at what other you know, offensive linemen were doing and their stances even on the other side of the line and the eyes, the eyes of running back. So here's an example. Um, if you had a young running back who was going to block you, uh, his eyes would usually be pretty big. <laughs> and he would be looking right at you because it's a new experience for him. I've got to block this guy who's a really good football player and I'm a, you know, 200 and 10 pound back and he's 255 pounds and then as they get older a lot of times they know that you're keen on them so they'll look everywhere but you so if you have a back that's been in the league for a while and he looks everywhere but you you know that he's kind of sizing up where he needs to go but trying not to give it away and then if you have a back who's been in the league a long time you don't even try to read him because he knows how to throw throw you off so those are the you know the fine details of of playing the defensive line that open up for you um, when you when you learn your keys and and then for me um, what happened was uh, football is is uh, the the critique comes when you're watching film on on a Monday or Tuesday whenever you go in after the game. And you don't want to make a mistake. You're horrified at making a mistake. But I got to the point where I was seeing so much on the field that I could start to guess a little bit and go out of position. And I was right about 90% of the time. And I remember one time, I can't remember, it was my third or fourth year of playing Cleveland Stadium. And I guessed, and I guessed wrong. And the ball carrier ran for like 12 yards, like right over where I was supposed to be. And in my mind, I was thinking, oh, Monday, the films, you know, the criticism that's going to come. And then it just came to me at that point. It was like it welled up inside and the F word came up and I said, F it. I know what I'm doing. I'm right most of the time. People can't, you know, I've been doing it for so long. 
at a high level that that if I am worried about you know one play where a guy gains 12 yards where I have other plays where I'm dragging guys down in the backfield you know play after play so it was at that point I developed my own style I felt and from that point on my game completely changed and that's when I made pro bowls and all pro and you know defensive player of the year Wow. Thank you for, for that answer. Um, if I recall an anecdote uh, you had told once, I think you also learned to wrap up fairly early on when Roman Gabriel didn't go down too easily. <laughs> that was my very first game. Uh, it was preseason game. We played the Rams in the Coliseum and I'd watched the Rams and Roman Gabriel since I was probably in junior high. I broke through the line and I hit him and I just kind of slid down his leg. And in the films on Monday or Tuesday, whenever we watched him, and my coach, uh, Dick Mojaleski said, uh, Jerry, in the NFL, you have to wrap up the quarterback. Well, it's true. You know, he was probably 6'5", I don't know, 230 or even heavier. So when I hit him, I expected him to go down, you know, like a quarterback from maybe, a, you know, Iowa State or something that was 195 pounds. So I learned to, to, to wrap them up after that. So if I can take everything you said and some key notes that I am taking from what you outlined. One, you became very good at a one-on-one -on -one sport. You were self-reliant and you, you were able to take that skill set and confidence from that and translate it into something else, a la football. Two, mentorship. You said you, you uh, of course, we're going to get into what you're doing now, but of course you found a mentor at the NFL level and a great coach, um, Dick Modulowski. From there, basically you, you got instant feedback on what you were doing from film. So you were able to sort of understand what you're doing right and wrong and continue the, this self-evolution to make sure that you were honing your craft. And basically, as you outlined for my, my fourth and final point here, is you said it took all of 30 minutes to figure out what the keys were, but it took years to master actually reading those keys efficiently. So if those are basically the four pillars of how you were able to continue to elevate yourself in your first career, how does one navigate life after being an athlete? when you're not going to get film on what you're doing more often than not, you know, particularly if you're running your own business, I mean, you, you lose the camaraderie, the, the ability to have that feedback. The keys are going to wild very like, depending on what you're doing, those keys are going to be all over the map. But basically if you don't have a mentor, you're not going to know those keys and it might take, it could be a very hard learning curve. So we have all outside of the identity part of this, of understanding you have to figure out what's next. How does one even begin to sort of take what you learned or, or the, what that process was to make you great and apply it to something else? Well, what a great question. Um, I think what it takes, I, I think as a football player, you have the drive and Everybody has, everybody that's made it at that level has certain characteristics. They know that if, if you get knocked down, you got to get up, you know, and if you have a bad play, you got to come back and try to make it a, a you know, a, a good play the next time or a bad practice, you need to have a good practice. And so you have this internal drive and you develop ways of of navigating your NFL career and systems and things like that. Uh, and you come out and you expect to have similar success in, in this life. And, you know, one of the things that I told myself and I know other players tell themselves is that, okay, you did this thing, everybody wants to do it and you did it. So you must be special. And in a way you, you, you are special, but when you get out into the real world, you realize that that doesn't easily transfer. You know, the drive does, um, but you have to find something to, to target, to, to, drive, to drive towards. So what I found was, and, and I had this, um, this business going, I had a freelance business and it was photography and I really liked it, but it wasn't a calling. And 
in, if you're a football player, you have to have a true calling to be successful in football. You just can't halfway do it or, you know, decide to practice hard one practice and not the next. The, uh, the experience of it, the rewards are so high and so immediate, immediate that it drives you towards that and you never let up on the gas. When you get out in the real world, you're ex trying to find a career that will give you that same passion and it won't necessarily happen right away. So for me, I became a pretty good photographer uh, but then I thought after a while, I was like, okay, I did this. I've done it for 10, 10 years post football, but I'm kind of bored now. And it doesn't really feel like a calling. It doesn't really feel like a passion for me. So I, I went back to school and I found something else. I actually studied psychology. I wanted to find out what made me tick. So in part, I was going back to study Jerry Shirk. Uh, and then I, um, Along the way, uh, I got into uh, studying athletic transition. There's a whole body of work in sports psychology called Ad athletic transition. It's the study of athletes as they move from elite sports or high performance sports to private life. Uh, and then that developed into um, uh, some internships. I was a school counselor. Um, and then I started working in mentoring programs uh, and, and I'm a consultant for the, I've been a consultant for the state of California and a national consultant for youth mentoring. My expertise is in, expertise is in, in, in group mentoring. Um, but so I'm going to try to wrap this up and say that, that you have to find a passion to be able to transfer all that because you may be doing something. I'll give you an example. I was taking photos uh, down at uh, what used to be Qualcomm Stadium of the Chargers games a couple of years after I got out and I was working as a uh, on assignment for Associated Press. And uh, back then you had to go into the dark room and actually we called it souping the film up. It is, there were no digital uh, cameras back then. And there was a young man that was maybe 25 years old down there at the same time. And he had the same assignment, like taking pictures of the NFL charger game, whoever they were playing. And I was about 34 having retired from football. And as the photo came up that this guy had taken, you know, if you see the old movies where the photo starts to, to come to life in the developing tray, it was a picture of somebody sacking the quarterback and he got really excited and he went, look at that shot. It's a great shot. And it was a great shot of the lineman flying through the air. And I didn't say anything at the time, but in my mind, I was going, you think that's great. I used to be that guy, you know, two years ago, I was that guy flying through the air. You have no idea, you know, what, <laughs> what that feels like. And so there I was working with a kid that was 25 year old, 25 years old, really excited about what he was doing. And I was 34 years old, kind of going, well, yeah, this is, this is okay, but it's not the NFL. So uh, you, you have to uh, eventually find something that's really going to, to light your fire. And it may not be the first, first thing. So for me, it was the second thing. It was mentoring and still, it didn't light my fire like football, but I was able to have a passion about it. And I, I um, was able to keep learning. And um, I, um, I know I'm rambling here a little bit, but I think you need to find something where you can put your 10,000 hours in because you, you, you put way more than 10,000 hours into football to, you know, to, to move towards mastery you need to find something that's a practice that you actually practice and that you get better at and that you move towards mastery. So you inter interviewed uh, Ed White, I believe last week. Ed's a really good friend of mine. He's an artist. He's got way more than 10,000 hours <laughs> working at art. He's probably got, you know, 200,000 hours of, of working with paintings and, and drawing. So he's, 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 got a level of mastery my teammate which i mentioned uh brian brian sype who was mvp of the league in 1980 he went into home design and architecture 
He's got way more than 10,000 hours. It was a passion for him. He's designed homes in Rancho Santa Fe, designed some homes for me. Uh, a teammate who didn't have that great a career, Matt Miller from the University of Colorado, uh, went back to school and got a, a master's in geology, a PhD in uh, mechanical engineering from Georgia Tech. And, and now he's been a full professor at Cornell University for, for 30 years. So he's put in his you know, 50 or 100,000 hours. So I know I'm rambling, but I think you know, the players don't get satisfaction from just coming out and, and shaking hands or um, you know, maybe helping somebody's business by being the ex-football player. That can pay the bills for a while. But I think players really get and need that satisfaction from moving to mastery. I don't think there's any question. Um, and I, yeah, Ed said he had been painting since he was about six. So I, th I think he, you know, he's <laughs> logged just a few hours. Um, <laughs> so, you know, you were able to get your, your psychology degree in 1990, which, you know, the quick math on that is, you know, 30 plus years uh, since then. Uh, I believe you have... Uh, for at least 21 years now, Mentor Management Systems has been the company that you know you founded and run. Mm -hmm. So do you mind just talking a little bit more about this journey since you, you did eventually find this calling? It wasn't photography, but you were able to get into this. Um, I know that you've worked with a bunch of companies. Of course, you've talked about athletes. What, what has just been some of your research? What has been some of the the things over the last few decades that have really driven you uh, and been the the aspects that you are most passionate about? I, um, going back to when I was studying psychology um, in the early 90s, and, and I was, I mentioned this, I was studying athletic transition. I also studied child psychology, which I realized was pretty close to athlete psychology because in some ways we, as athletes, we never, we never grow up or we have a hard time growing up. So I was actually looking for a model for transition, you know, like in um, substance abuse, it's that um, AA has got the 12 steps. Um, and so I was looking for something for athletes as they go through the transition and I couldn't find anything, nothing that resonated for me. And so um, I actually um, found my best information in something called the hero's journey in mythology. And uh, it's this fellow who he passed away probably 20 years ago, but he was a professor named Joseph Campbell. And uh, he's got a great following and people who write screenplays and movies and books follow his hero's journey. So what he said is that we're all heroes we're all the protagonists of our own stories. And it started, began to resonate with me at that point, because as a football player, one of the big things about playing football is that you're a hero, you're a, fo you're a football hero. And uh, so what he said is that there are stages to the journey or a guidepost, and uh, that we go from an ordinary world to a special world. So the ordinary world is the world maybe of childhood, and of not being a very good athlete, if you're on this athletic journey, and then the special world is, is when you when you're able to go out there and and perform and get all <clears throat> the benefits and the reward. <clears throat> Pardon me, the benefits and rewards of being a football player, and then the last stage is the return. We always have to come back to where we lose some of that that power. Uh, so this journey really resonated with me. And um, so I, I actually, I developed a business for a while, uh, athletic transition specialist, but um, I had difficulty because the clients wouldn't come in because they were heroes. They didn't want to admit that, that they, you know, were feeling depression or anxiety or whatever. Uh, but for me, as I, as I looked at it, I came up with three things and I've tried to live these things for the last 25, 30 years. So I realized for me on this self-study and this journey and the athlete's second journey that I'm on, that I had to do three things. 
the number one thing is I had to let go of that pass because I would never be a ball player chasing Terry Bradshaw down, flying through the air from his blind side and, and hitting him in front of 85,000 screaming Cleveland fans. I would never have the fame. My body would never be the same. Um, you know, on and on, you know, camaraderie on and on and on. So I had to let go. The second thing I realized is I did have to master something else to feel that self-worth, to feel the growth in me, to feel that uh, I was creating, a, you know, reinventing myself, creating a new identity. And so that happened through psychology and having group mentoring programs where I actually was the facilitator and training uh, programs, how to develop programs, and then actually having my own mentees. Uh, and then the third thing, and these things are all related, I realized that I had to, to give back. Uh, to, to play in the NFL or any high performance sport is a very narcissistic act. It's always about you. Um, how am I going to get bigger, better, stronger? Um, how, how's, you know, my technique going to be better? Um, how, how am I going to make Pro Bowls? Uh, everything is about you, even though the, the, the team concept comes in it too. So um, it really aligns with your life cycle to this third key the giving back because as you get older it can't be all about yourself you know the first half of life kind of is about yourself creating that identity and then the second half is more about focusing on you know like your children and your grandchildren so there's a a great developmental theorist his name was eric erickson and he he developed theories about the adult stages of life I think he had seven or eight stages, maybe eight stages. And the seventh stage he called generativity. And the word generativity really means to, to generate life or to give back. So he said the positive outcome for a life is to be a doting grandparent. And the negative outcome for a life is to be a bitter grandparent that doesn't give time to their grandkids. So you don't necessarily physically, literally have to be a grandparent. It's just an attitude. So the attitude should be, you know, I went on this journey. I learned a lot on the journey. I'm coming back from the journey. How do I help other people? I'm not going to be a warrior anymore. I'm not going to put on the helmet and the shoulder pads. But how do I help other people? young people no matter what journey it is that that they're that they're looking at or even help them find what their calling is so that may be maybe not the <laughs> the exact question that you asked me but that's kind of been my life experience and 25 years ago it was kind of a theory and now that i'm in my early 70s i went well um i i've lived it so I guess that works, at least for me. <laughs> so uh, it, it seems like whether you are the, the bitter grandparent or the doting grandparent, on some level, I guess, the end of the hero's journey, you are in a position where you can be a mentor or you can choose to be on the outside being resentful. Uh, I, I think it's just a rearticulation of, of what you had just said. So, I mean, at what point, to me, then it's obvious that the best thing that a successful person can do is to come back, give back, be that mentor. I have to imagine that that, that had a lot to do with, you know, you wanting to stay involved in mentorship as long as you have is seeing the importance of not just for the individual at the end of their journey, giving back, but what it means to the young person who actually needs the mentor. Because you know, whether you grew up in a nice environment with both parents and everything was great, or you're an inner city kid and it's been much tougher. I mean, it's across the board what sort of what circumstances you're born into. Mentorship can make or break 
you know, someone's you know, trajectory, regardless of what that starting point is. Um, I, I know that you mentioned kids. Uh, so I did just want to briefly touch on that before we circle back to um, what you had alluded to earlier that you've uh, spoke with a lot of former players in, in just some of uh, what that research had sort of uh, unveiled to you. Um, when I spoke to former players, and I'm still speaking to them today you know and asking questions i was at a, an event this weekend and there was a guy who'd played for about four nfl teams and he was approaching his 70s and and i asked him uh how the, his transition was and at first he said oh yeah it was just fine you know and i had this you know guy that took me under his wing for business and everything and then i told him i said well i've you know i've studied the transition and you know and i'm a former player and i know that it's hard and then he kind of went huh ah. Yeah, it was hard. <laughs> um, he said, I, I realized that that you had to grow up and I didn't have a lot of time. You know, we didn't have a lot of time together to talk, but I'm sure he could have told me a big story about how, how difficult his transition had been. But you got him to put the shield down, though. <laughs> sort of get on the level with you. <laughs> I, you know, I think that that's part of it. There, there's a um, there's if you look up on the Internet and, and put in uh, the loyal soldier. There's this uh, situation where, and I believe it uh, was World War II in the Philippines, and they had these Japanese soldiers that were staked out on some different islands, and they didn't know the war was over. Like I know the story. You know the story, and and so what the Japanese, some of the Japanese people did, they'd bring these fellows back, and they'd have a ceremony. And it would be the, I don't know if they call it the loyal soldier ceremony, but they would say, thank you for your service. You're done now. You can put, you know, your helmet and your shoulder pads, your, you know, your rifle away. And you're, you're not that anymore. We need you to go out and to, to be a good person in our society, not an aggressive, violent person, you know, living in the past. So it'd be great if football players, could have that. I'm still waiting for my retirement party. Nobody's, <laughs> nobody's thrown one to me or for me. But about 25 years ago, when I was doing my study, Steve, I, um, I sent out a questionnaire to over 100 ball players, And I think it was somewhere around 80 um, wrote back and I had them rate their stressors. What was the most stressful or what did you miss most? I'll have to get into my file cameras to see what I actually asked them. But basically I listed seven or eight things and it was camaraderie, financial, sense of mastery, maybe identity, uh, fame, you know, the things that come with an NFL career. And out of the, let's say 80 people that responded, 79 checked at least one, you know, one box, like this is what I missed. And interestingly, they were all different. I mean, it was kind of across the board. So for me, if you ask me what I miss, I miss the sense of mastery. And I, I'll have to admit, I, I kind of, although it was irritating at the time, I, I kind of miss being famous. You, you miss being, you know, known for something. Uh, other people would say, you know, football was like having a family for me. And I feel like I don't, have that family feeling anymore and you know, the camaraderie some people would just say finances i don't have the money that i used to, used to have so it's different for different people and maybe different for them at different times of their lives there was only one person who didn't uh who said he didn't have any issues and i guess i since he didn't have any issues and i think he's passed on i can say his name it was rosie greer who was actually a famous uh, defensive lineman for the New York Giants, who uh, was also an actor and did so many things. And he was actually a friend of Bobby Kennedy's and he was there at that hotel in Los Angeles when Bobby Kennedy got shot, which is kind of a side note, but he was one person out of 80 that said, no problem. Potentially from the person that had uh, seemingly anyway, by uh, hit that second career, you know, if you're 
if you're able to sort of parlay that fame into something else, which, uh, you know, today's NFL landscape, um, pro athlete landscape seems easier to do than ever with the amount of cameras and social media that, you know, some will be able to never have to work again, that maybe those they'll never experience that the loss of fame, the loss of financial stability, the camaraderie. Well, you know, if they're, if they're still famous, that cast of characters might change over time, but there's still a cast of characters that want and seek them out. So it's a, uh, he, he was one of uh, the, the very few, I guess. I think it has to, for most guys, it has to come from the inside out. You know, sure. when you retire, whatever you do needs to, to have uh, some, sense of this this is new and it's a challenge to me because we're used to a challenge and it can't be handed to you so it needs to be from the inside out and not the outside in i think there are people that um you know like you say in today's social media and publicity scene maybe maybe they're famous enough where they never have to to want as far as financially but i i think you know we're we're warriors and and some of the the phrases that i came across when i was doing my research they still resonate with me and one is that you're you're a warrior without a war i mean you're used to fighting a war and now you're set up internally you're a warrior but there's no war to fight and then another one that was just kind of shocking to me and it's probably shocking to other people when they hear it um, and this question came up is what do you do when you're done being a hero? I'll let that sink in. What do you do when you're done being a hero? And the answer is you die because you, you're not that anymore. And it's really good if you can't, you know, the quicker you die, the better. Um, I'll tell a story. There was uh, a guy who I, I was in a PhD program for a while, and and uh, I had a professor who was a a counselor to military veterans, and he had been counseling this one guy that had PTSD and and couldn't put his military career behind him, and he said that I he said I had him describe what it was like, you know, in the field. And he talked about battle and being with his comrades and and being in danger. And uh, so my professor, the counselor, said, well, how did that make you feel? And the, the, the fellow said, well, I've never felt so alive. And the professor said at that time, he reached over and grabbed the guy by the shoulders. And he said, well, you don't have that anymore, do you? And, and I think that, that that was so profound because I think that's what we need as ball players. We need somebody to take us, you know, look us in the face and grab our shoulders and go, well, you don't have that anymore now. What are you going to do now? And that's when I say the hero dies, that's the, the, that's the death of the hero. And you need that death so you can become a hero in a different way. You start your second journey uh, using what you learned on your first journey, the drive, the mentors, you know, the hero's journey. Um, I, I've done a kind of reduced version because there are about 18 or 20, maybe more guideposts that Campbell came up with. So my simple guideposts are the calling, the fear of the call, meeting with the mentor, crossing the threshold into the special world, practice, test, fulfillment, and then return. And we all need to return. We need to return and realize we're not that anymore, but the sooner we can let go of that, the, you know, the more we can become. Absolutely. Uh well, Jerry, as we get close to wrapping up here, uh, as a football junkie, I, I can't help myself. You were such a dominant player in the 70s. I need to ask you, as a former dominant defensive lineman, 
two centers really stood out to me. You know, you got Jim Otto at the end of his career in Jim Langer. If you want to talk about guards, we have Gene Upshaw, Tom Mack, Larry Little, John Hanna, and oh, Ed White. If you want to talk about tackles, you know, if you just look at the pro bowlers year in, year out, Ron Yeri, Rayfield Wright, Art Shell, Dan Deardorf. When it came to what made, and I say that the, I mention offensive linemen because as a defensive lineman, your job is quite literally to line up against these men and, and beat them every play. What made the best the best, in your opinion? Um, you know, position doesn't matter, but just I, I name those people, and I know you've given credit to the Pittsburgh Steelers offensive line previously, but what made it the best that you had to go up against um, and, and basically you know, assert yourself as the hero what, who gave you the, the, the toughest fits and, and what was it about them that made them so special and memorable? Gosh, what makes the best the best? That's, that's, that's a tough question. I, I think it's just that they're complete players and that uh, they have the physical ability. But beyond that, you know, you really, you, re, you need the, the drive and, um, I think, you know, when, when I th when I think about my own career, and it doesn't quite match the Hall of Famers, although I was nominated once, <laughs> it's just the 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 depth that that they go, you know, the every part of their game, the the workouts, the the practices, you know, just like Ed White, who should be in the Hall of Fame. He developed a system. I asked Ed about his system. He said when anything went wrong in a play on the way back to the huddle, he would just start evaluating by looking at his body or thinking about his body. He said, was it my feet? Was it the wrong steps? Were my knees in the wrong position? How about my waist? What did I do with my... So these guys just go to this tremendous depth. Uh, Willie Buchanan, who was a defensive back for Green Bay and an all-pro I had him in front of a group of uh, high school kids out here, I don't know, 10 years ago. And without prompting him before, I asked him, Willie, tell the kids what you see as you walk to the line or, you know, when the other team comes to the line. And it had been 20 years since he played and he just went boom, boom, boom. He said, I look at this and I look at that. And if this guy goes in motion, and, you know, this is 20 years later. So it's just the depth of the detail uh, that these these guys that these guys go. Um, funny story about Jim Langer, who's a Hall of Pro uh, Hall of Fame guy. Uh, he he was a free agent from Bemidji State, Minnesota, uh, and he was uh, with the Browns his first year. His first year and my first year were the same. Uh, we were both rookies. I was second round draft choice. He was a free agent. He showed a lot of promise in training camp, but because he was a free agent, they cut him from the Cleveland Browns and he went to Miami and became a, a Hall of Fame player. So, um, you know, for him, it was just, you know, I knew him just hard work and determination. Very cool. Yeah. Well, Jerry, the last question I have for you, uh, it, there's been so much that you've said, uh, particularly as it relates to the, the second act and taking those principles of success. But if you could, if we could end this on what's the best piece of advice that you would give to the, that young teenager that's just starting out as to how to live their best life and achieve their own success? What, how would you like to leave this? Um. I would actually give two pieces of advice and, and um, they're both from Joseph Campbell, the great mythologist who outlined the hero's journey. And, and one has become fairly famous in, you know, in, in our culture. And that's, he said to follow your bliss and your bliss is your passion. So, and this is for retiring players too, but also for young people is whatever that thing that is that catches you on fire, just just try to try to follow it as far as you can. And then one of the things that happens, a big thing is it's always about overcoming your fears. So what Joseph Campbell said was that you don't have to do it all at once. 
but just try, just try to be a little bit braver every day. There you have it. Jerry, thank you so much for taking the time. Now, as we actually wrap this up, uh, where can people follow you or, or learn more about any of the work that you're doing? Well, I'm not a Twitter guy. Uh, <laughs> so uh, my email is Jerry, M as in man, Shirk, S-H-E-R-K at Gmail. So J-E-R-R-Y, M as in man, Shirk at gmail.com. Um, I also, I, I'm on the leadership team with a group called the California Mentoring Partnership. So if you Google that, that'll, that'll take you there. And my email will be also be there. And um, I've been toying with uh, writing a book about the athlete's second journey. So stay tuned for that. Well, we will have to have you back on then so we can talk about that when that's a little closer to being uh, coming to fruition. Great. Jerry, thank you so much for taking the time. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Steve. I enjoyed it too.